been a busy time with new releases for carmaker mahindra of late but first some background the buck banging pickup has been the backbone of mahindra's local onslaught for years now up until a couple of months ago when the all-terrain scorpio suv arrived and it was a strong sign that the indian brand was moving away from its regional roots more towards an urban centric push which brings us to this the new, at least for Australia, XUV700. And it's a vitally crucial model for Mahindra, and here are some reasons why. Firstly, it gets conventional monocoque style passenger car construction, which makes it more on-road centric than its past offerings. Secondly, it's a seven-seater and it shoehorns those three rows into a 4.7 meter long mid-size SUV body. And thirdly, unlike its other stablemate, it arrives here in Australia purely with turbocharged petrol power. Clearly Mahindra is now targeting mainstream buyers and taking on the likes of Toyota's RAV4, so it needs to bring something significant to that party. So let's find out what it offers in its pitch for the red hot mid-size SUV segment, starting off with pricing. Chasing cars, honest reviews of your next car. Brought to you by Budget Direct. The thing is, is the XUV700 is so new to the Australian market that even here at the Australian launch, I don't know what the price is. Why? That's because the big wigs from Mahindra are over there in the bunker still sorting that out. So I'm gonna have a lash and take a guess. So it's gonna be offered in two versions, a base AX7 and a high spec AX7L. And I'm taking a punt that the base car is gonna be around $36,000 drive away and the top spec is gonna be around 39. Well, I was pretty close to the money there. Outside, the base car gets LED headlights, these flush mounted exterior door handles, a reversing camera, and these rather fetching 18 inch diamond cut rims. You also get a full length glass panoramic roof, which is a fine inclusion for a base model. What's interesting is that the top spec looks pretty much identical to the base version. And that's largely the case inside as it is outside. So that's where we're gonna go next to the interior. Okay, we've jumped in the cabin. And the first impressions are is it's actually pretty upmarket here for a sub $40,000 car. Interestingly enough, this is the base model. So the base model gets a conventional handbrake rather than an electric handbrake. But other than that, it's really difficult to pick the two versions apart. This sort of cream effect is actually standard and it's the only color scheme that you can get on both versions. Now, Mahindra does say that Aussie buyers do love a black interior and they're considering that, but at the moment, cream's the only one that you can get. So this is leatherette, not real leather, so it's likely to be more resistant to grime than the genuine stuff. Another little nice touch too is the double stitching, including the soft touch dash fascia pad. And again, you get a lot of stuff for an entry level car. So for example, you get these Benz style electric seat adjustment, and you also get the huge panoramic roof, which is 1.3 meters in length. Outside of that, almost everything about the cabin is conventional and quite familiar. Everything is laid out logically and there's nothing weird or strange at play. However, the seat bases on all of the seats is actually quite high. When you do sit in the passenger seat, you do actually risk hitting your head on speakers that are in the high-spec model. But pride of place of the cabin and the real highlight is the dual 10 and a quarter inch screens. They're by a company called Visteon who also supplies Mercedes-Benz. And unsurprisingly, they're very bright, very crisp, and quite upmarket. No matter which way you go, both Apple CarPlay and Android Auto are wired, but if you do opt for the up-spec L, you do get inductive charging. But when you do splurge on the L, instead of getting just a reversing camera, you get a 360 degree system that you can actually push and rotate with a remote view. Another feature with the driver's screen in the high spec model is that you do get the blind spot view monitoring camera system and it kind of puts the camera view central around the two exterior roundels. So while some of this stuff is slick, some of it is a bit workmanlike. Take for example the HVAC system which looks like it could have been lifted out of any car for the past 10 years. Although you do handily get a lot of physical control so you don't have to go digging around in submenus. You also get a rotary multimedia controller which you can assign as a volume. It is very handy although it does feel a little bit flimsy. Another interesting bit is that some of these touch buttons feel quite good but some of them you discover don't actually work at all and are blank. You do get two USB-A ports up front and one single USB-C in the rear, which is a bit of a strange mix. And if there's a really strange quirk on the specification list, it's that the high spec version gets reach adjustment, whereas the base version doesn't. Why? Apparently it's because the high spec version gets seven airbags, including a driver's knee bag, whereas the regular version, which is this one, 
get six. You do get full cabin coverage and talking about the rest of the cabin, let's check out row two. As you can see, they haven't cheaped out on the second row. Presentation in here is very good, including the fact that they trim trimmed the back of the seats and it's not hard cheap plastic as you would expect in a sub $40,000 vehicle. Room here is actually pretty decent as well, although it's a little bit restrictive in headroom, but it's not too bad for a three row midsize 4.7 meter long SUV. Rear inclusions include the aforementioned USB-C port, a couple of air vents, and this very handy, what they call an ergo lever, where the rear passenger can push the front passenger seat forward. And I'm sure that's gonna be annoying for some front passengers. The rear seat is 60-40 split, and you do get tilt adjustment in the back, but no slide adjustment with the base. And you get this fairly nifty one-touch tumbling feature to get access to the third row, and that's where we're gonna go next. Is that of any surprise, it's really quite cramped here in the third row. That's really par for the course when you try and shove three rows of seating inside a mid-size SUV. But it's really no more constrictive than a Nissan X-Trail or a Mitsubishi Outlander. A couple of big pluses in here is that you do actually get air vents as well as a fan control, which is a big thumbs up for me. You also get a 12 volt outlet and cup holders, but it's definitely a space best fit for small kids. Right, let's check out the boot. In terms of boot space, Mahindra's not making any claims in terms of the leaderage because really, there's not much of it. In fact, in order for this to be a properly functioning boot, you do have to convert it to a five-seater. Which is pretty easy to do and it liberates about 450 to 500 litres. Again, Mahindra is not sane. Does it function better as a five-seater than a seven-seater? Perhaps so. And Mahindra has also admitted that it's considering a five-seat version for Australia. Right, that's how it's packaged. Let's take it for a drive. In its Indian homeland, the XUV700 comes in a choice of petrol or diesel powertrains. However, the Aussie product planners have decided to ditch the oiler in favour for one sole engine, which is a two litre direct injected petrol turbo four. Power is 149.2, yes, 0.2 kilowatts, and that arrives at 5,000 RPM. But probably the more beneficial aspect of this engine is the 380 newton meters, which is a fair bit of torque for a mid-sized SUV. And that clocks on at 1750 RPM. Response from the engine is impressively crisp. And when you do dig in, there is quite a bit of surly thrust in the mid-range. It's paired with a six-speed ASIN transmission that's shared with all manner of vehicles from Europe and Asia. It's not a lot of forward ratios to play with, but the Mahindra doesn't really suffer for it. As a combination, it's pretty smooth and refined, although the ASIN transmission can get a little bit grainy and could be a little bit smoother under acceleration. All in all, it gets along quite nicely, but that does come at a cost at the Bowser. Mahindra claims low eights for combined fuel consumption, and to be honest, that's not too great for a mid-size SUV. Although the dividend that you do get is the turbocharged power. When it comes to the chassis, the steering is, well, it's pretty aloof and vague. However, the front end is pretty direct and it does point where you want it. It is generally pretty quiet and refined. There's a little bit of wind noise around the mirrors, but I've got to say the comfort levels in here are pretty good for a vehicle at this price point. The real highlight for me in the driving experience is the ride and handling balance. In that, the XUV700 brings lots of the former, but not too much compromise to the latter. I'm one up here at the moment and the ride is compliant and very settled. We've also had four blokes in here with luggage and it's still quite supportive, doesn't crash through and that compliance is maintained throughout the whole driving experience. Some of that ride comfort is down to the 60 series tires, but Mahindra has done a good job on the damping, although the rebound does get a little bit bouncy. I would even go as far to say that the ride quality in here is as good, if not better, than some SUVs at twice or three times the price. Handling is acceptable. It weighs in at 1800 kilograms and it does a pretty decent job of body control and handling that weight in the corners. More in its wheelhouse is towing and it will tow 1500 kilos braked and pretty acceptable for a mid-size monocoque SUV. I must say, in terms of initial impression, the XUV700 fares really, really well. And I go as far to say that it punches above its weight for the on-road experience for a vehicle at its price. Next up is safety, and disclaimer time, I did go pretty hard on its stablemate, the Scorpio, for lacking autonomous emergency braking and other safety features. But this urban-centric SUV certainly fares a lot better. And you do get other features such as lane departure warning, lane keeping, and adaptive cruise control as standard on both variants. 
However, you do need to step up to the high spec version to get blind spot view monitoring through the driver's screen and neither version gets rear cross traffic alert. So what do we think about the all new SUV that Mahindra is pinning its mainstream hopes and dreams on? Firstly, the positives. The XUV700 offers a lot of metal glass rubber and features for the coin that it asked for. And I must say for its sharp pricing, the digital screens, the sunroof and the power from that turbo engine will win a lot of potential buyers over. It offers seven seat practicality that some of its rivals miss and it packs a lot more safety than its stablemate Scorpio alternative. Downsides? Well, when you try and squeeze three rows in a midsize SUV, there's always going to be a compromise in space, particularly in the third row and the scant boot. And while some of the goodies that it offers really represents good value for money, some of its execution is quite workmanlike. So while the XUV700 is certainly shaping up to be a compelling offering, it is ultimately an SUV that's built to a price. So that's what I think, but how about you? Put your thoughts in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe while you're at it. And as always, thanks for watching Chasing Cars.